Uh, good morning, everyone. We've got a full house today. Thank you very much for joining us for the Lumibird Symposium for Laser for Retina and Vitreous. Um, my name is Kenneth Fong. Um, the, Victor Chong couldn't make it because uh, he's had problems with his flight from the US, but he has sent a pre-recorded recording which I'll play. Uh, this morning, we have uh, Dr. Alejandro Filorius from Spain, uh, Professor Paolo Stanga from London, uh, and we'll be covering a range of topics about laser users in 2023 for the retina and the vitreous. And I think this is one of only two sessions dedicated towards laser in the e-retina. I'm very happy to see many of you here. I'm sure we're all a bit overdosed with anti-VEGF and dual inhibition. So I think it's good to have a change of uh, tech as well. And thank you very much for joining us. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll make a start. I'll run Victor's presentation, which he has uh, pre-recorded. And then we'll go through my presentation and then Alejandro. And then uh, we'll have questions for uh, retina, and then after that, we'll have Paolo's presentation about vitreous, and we'll have some questions for, for him after that. Ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize that I cannot be with you in person today because of a personal reason. I was asked to give a talk on when to use thermal laser and when to use the fresco laser. My financial disclosure as followed. I have an employee for Johnson & Johnson, but this talk is out with the J&J employment and is not endorsed by J&J. I'm also a consultant for Nymphabird Medical, and which is a laser manufacturer, which is relevant to this talk. Let me start with the take home messages. For suppressor laser, our goal is to improve LPE's function without killing them. The main indication is diabetic macular edema and central serous retinopathy. For thermal laser, we are actually killing the LPE cell and often the photoreceptors. The main per indication are proliferative diabetic retinopathy by destroying the ischemic retina or in retinal hole or retinal detachment to create a barrier and then also that used in tumour which you can use that to destroy a lesion. Let's have a quick revision of how does laser work in macular diseases. Historically, we thought that we were shooting at the red dot and by closing the microaneurysm directly with direct coagulation. However, over the years, our understanding of laser treatment in macular disease have changed, and we now know energy was actually absorbed by the RPE cell and changed the microenvironment, leading to the closure of the microaneurysm and reduced edema. So the target of the laser is RPE cell and not the retina. This has been illustrated with this cartoon from some years ago that we believe that when you shoot a laser into the eye, you have killed the photoreceptor and RPE cell. And then if the cells are dead, there would be no reason that you will be able to reducing the edema. And we have now noted that inside that dead zone, it's in the middle, but in the surrounding area, the cells are not dead and we will call it the sublevel zone. And it's in this area that action takes place and inducing the change of microenvironment and then leading to the absorption of edema. This work was supported from some years ago using this particular concept in an animal experiment. As you can see here, that you view using the energy too low, you do not creating a lot of area of that zone. However, that you also do not have a large area of sublethal zone. And similarly, that if you can also create too much damage, and then uh, that would not be particularly helpful. The difficulty is how to actually get it just right, and that has been a little bit challenging. 
in this particular experiment in rabbits, that around 30% of just visible is equated to around just right. But you can see that even 25%, the energy might be too low, and then 40%, you might be already a bit more damaged. So the potential therapeutic window, it could be very narrow, and again, it could be very difficult to carry out in a human being with additional variability on the optical medium and so on. Indeed, in the paper, have shown that there is a very narrow therapeutic window. And to try to get that controlled, using conventional laser is rather challenging. So over the years, there is a consideration is how we can deliver more energy without damage, and also how that um, we can have a slightly bigger therapeutic window, allowing more variability. And the concept of micropulse or subliminal laser have been emerged over 20 years ago. The concept is that instead of conventional laser, the laser are creating a particular energy until that a visible burn can be seen, but instead that they were created in little pulses, and between the pulses of energy, you allowed the tissue to cool off a little bit and leading to less damage, therefore able to continue to delivering energy without damage. Luckily, that this can be all done by the laser itself from a physician point of view, that you just need to press on the pedal and then this train of laser would be delivered. Even way back in 2017, there is multiple study to show that there is efficacy using this subthreshold methodology on DME and CSR. And subsequent to that, there is also multiple additional study. One of the main criticism for some of these earlier study, they are often single center and they are not have a control group and indeed, that is why that there is reason of concern whether that is really uh, as good as a conventional laser. So I was part of the Diamond Study Group, which were using the opportunity in the UK that when you have central involved diabetic macular edema, but you only have mild edema, you are not automatically given anti-VEGF. And in this group of patients have relatively high unmet need, but because of the reason of reimbursement, that we were not able to treat this patient with anti-VEGF. And using that opportunity, we have carried out a multi-center study recruiting 266 patients and using a non-inferiority design to compare subthreshold laser versus conventional laser. And indeed, that it was published earlier this year, after some years of working on this project, and it did show that the two types of laser are equivalent. Now one would argue that if it is equivalent, why do we need to change to subthreshold laser? And just like a lot of study, within a relatively short period of time, there might be no measurable difference. But as we know, that is a fresh flow laser, they do not have any scarring that is visible. But with conventional laser, laser scar do occur, and we do see the laser scar expand over years. So at least that what we can demonstrate that within the study period of a year, there was no meaningful differences, and indeed suggesting that 
cut the flash flow laser is at least as good as conventional laser in the short term and theoretically speaking that it might be better in the long term and again something that um, we might never be able to prove it but the principle is that number one in the past people mentioned that a threshold laser does not work at all and but it's now shown that it's as good as conventional laser number two is yes we might never be able to show the long-term benefit but it just simply makes sense that no scarring will be better for the patient in the long term and indeed that we have small study in the past to suggest that microperimetry can be improved after suppressed laser. Unfortunately, multi microperimetry is difficult to implement in a multi-center study. So what about thermal laser? Are we not supposed to use thermal laser anymore? Well, I think the answer is not true. Indeed, thermal laser is, very, is still very useful in our everyday practice. Indeed, the most commonly used in routine practice for thermal laser is proliferated diabetic retinopathy. When anti VEGF was first available, we have seen that the fast response of new vessel on the disc with anti VEGF therapy. There was a bit of excitement that we thought that we can stop destroying the retina using laser. However, that the DLCLNet study comparing conventional thermal laser with anti VEGF really did not show a meaningful significant benefit. In fact, that for those who have lost the follow up from anti VEGF therapy alone, they had much worse outcome. Indeed, today, very few physicians would using anti VEGF alone for proliferative diabetic retinopathy for long term. Yes, a combination of anti VEGF as well as proliferative diabetic retinopathy or a short term use has been seen, but we need to combine that with a very robust follow up regimen. When you're looking at this case, that even a very relatively light PR laser, it would actually be able to remove and make the new vessel on the disc disappear. And indeed, a relatively light laser critical activation can achieve good result as well as relatively preservation of visual field. Just for culture, that we do use thermal laser for retinal tear as well as to use it to destroy peripheral retinal tumors. Although those cases are less common, but it's still very useful technique that we can use even today. So going back to my take-home message, suppressed for laser can improve RPE function without killing them. The main indication is diabetic macular edema and central serous retinopathy. For thermal laser, on the other hand, the aim is to kill the RPE cell and photoreceptor or the tumors. And in proliferated diabetic retinopathy, you try to kill the ischemic retina. And for retinal hole and detachment, you try to create a barrier and that will be a full thickness burn and in a tumor you want to destroy the lesion. The only slight difference might be as I mentioned earlier that for proliferative diabetic retinopathy you might only need to get to the outer retina and allowing some of the overlapping ganglion cell fiber to get past and leading to some degree of visual field preservation. And once again, thank you for your attention and I do apologize again for not able to be with you this year.
Great. Thank you. So um, I think we are also, this is also streamed live as well, so, and also available online. So the next topic, I'm just going to elaborate, elaborate more about why subthreshold laser technology matters and why all of us um, as retinal specialists should be aware of this modality uh, to bring it back for the use of our patients when we go back next week. Um, just a show of hands, how many of you in the audience has access to any subthreshold laser technology? Yeah, it's about 50% of the room, and I think um, as your older laser machines, um, you replace them, um, almost all the new laser machine technologies have, have some sort of sub-threshold laser um, uh, software or technology built in. So it has evolved tremendously in the last uh, 50 years, and from the first development of the uh, mayor schwick um, carbon arc laser in 1949, um, we have moved <laughs> rapidly in the last 20 years, uh, PDT laser, followed by the multi-sport sub laser technologies. Professor Stanga is one of the pioneers in multi-sport laser technologies. And uh, also in the development of 577 nanometer uh, laser fiber technolo laser technology as well. So now we have very compact um, laser machines compared to the giant ones that were available in our, in our clinics or hospitals about 30, 40 years ago. So it's really different nowadays where we talk about when we talk to patients about laser, the traditional thinking is a very destructive, very painful technique. Uh, but we have to move on to the new uh, technology whereby it's quick, fast, and efficient. So we know that intravitreal uh, anti-VEGFs are the first line for many uh, macular diseases, especially diabetic macular edema. Um, but we have to understand that in protocol T, about 40% uh, patients receive laser in protocol T. 40% uh, of them had prior laser. So a lot of them had a combination of laser and anti-VEGF in that real life um, study uh, in, in, a, in the United States. So as Victor has mentioned, later photoagulation is a destructive laser. And when it was first introduced 50 years ago, it causes a, a burn. Uh, at the area of what we call the microaneurysms and leakage to reduce the amount of oxidates and it's extremely effective by leaves behind a scar that progressively enlarges with time. For PRP laser, we all know the effectiveness at um, calming down the eye and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, but again, this is a traditional large spot size, heavy burn that will leave, lead the patients having a constricted visual field uh, with time. So, we know that retinal atrophy and thinning occur in the areas of the laser application, and then this causes scotoma to our patients. So this has led to the development of multi-spot laser, which is standard now in almost all the modern uh, laser machines available. And this is a quite a standard uh, multi-spot laser for patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And at the same time, for our diabetic patients, many of them have co uh, coexistent DME. You can also consider subthreshold laser treatment which is what I do in combination with anti-VEGF. So the main problem that we have faced when we are dealing with sub laser is that you don't see any visible signs or, scar or, or scarring at the macula when you apply the laser burn. So the concept that we have to bring, we, I want to bring across and share is the concept of titration, whereby you adjust the power of the laser according to the patient and then reduce the power according to the duty cycle and then apply it to the thickened areas of the macula. So for DME and CSR, it's quite similar. The, we use a 5% duty cycle, uh, 160 micron spot size, 200 uh, millisecond duration in a confluent pattern. And for DME, uh, I use the OCT thickness map, which allows me to, uh, to see the, uh, the thickness and I, and I bring it into the room and I when I do the laser on a patient, I treat all the thickened areas uh, with a sub laser. For CSR, you need to do a fluorescein angiogram to identify the areas of leakage, and then apply the laser to the areas of leakage as you would, as you would if you were doing a conventional PDT, a half fluence or half dose PDT laser. So you can customize the, the laser setting, um, and, then, and then that's exactly how you do a panretinal photocoagulation whereby uh, you might adjust the power accordingly to the patient to achieve a visible burn. So there are three principal types of modern subthreshold laser, which is the subliminal, 
uh, laser available from Lumibird, the MicroPulse, which is in the Iridex systems. Um, so it based on the emission of short repetitive pulses that last for microseconds, and in between there's a cooling period that allows the RPE cells to cool off. The endpoint management is something that was available in the Pascal system, but it's a bit complicated now because uh, the Pascal and Iridex system have sort of been combined together in a single platform. So I'm not very sure how, how they're gonna do that. And there's also the nanosecond uh, uh, 2RT laser technology. Uh, again, it's not widely available. So the first one, which is subliminal stroke micropulse, remains the main uh, subthreshold laser technology available in the market. So as I mentioned, these are the different uh, laser available. And I think Victor wrote a very nice review article, uh, which you can, can look up for uh, to find out about what are the different types of uh, lasers and how they are different from each other. So again, when you do the subliminal laser, uh, you don't see any OCT autofluorescence changes. A lot of people ask, should I see a scar on autofluorescence or fluorescein angiography? And you shouldn't because you're aiming for a very low 5% uh, duty cycle burn to stimulate the RPE cells to reduce the edema rather than destroy the RPE cells. So it is now clear that no visible changes are needed as multiple studies have shown that you can achieve reduction in macular edema without uh, causing any scar and a macula. And this is a, one of the papers uh, from Victor's uh, group many, many years ago, which shows over time, four months after a single micropulse laser treatment, the reduction of exudates and complete resolution of edema with just one single uh, application of subthreshold micropulse laser. So this is based on a stimulation concept where you have a cooling period in between the pulses resulting in no visible scarring, no detectable photoreceptor loss. And we've had more than 50 studies published uh, worldwide showing the efficacy in DME and CSR. And if you want to read it, the, it was written as a review by Sasha Fauser a few years ago. So my group, we did a very similar trial to the Diamond study uh, many, many years ago. This was using a 15% duty cycle. Again, we showed that uh, the subthreshold laser was not inferior to conventional laser with the advantage of not causing any visible scarring uh, uh, to, the, to the macular area. So I'd like to uh, share with you that uh, in the last three years, we formed the Subthreshold Ophthalmic Laser Society to share the knowledge of this technology with the rest of the world. We have uh, board members from all over the world, Latin America, uh, Europe, Asia, Pacific, North America, uh, Victor Chung's president, Lee Tae Woo, Jay Chablani, Alejandro, and myself are the executive committee. And together, uh, I'd like to recommend that you access this uh, free article published in I a couple of years ago about the subthreshold therapy laser guidelines for retinal diseases, which covers all the different machines so that when we are doing uh, laser and sharing our results with one another, this is the standardized methodology whereby we recommend a 5% duty cycle, 200 millisecond pulse duration, between 150 to 200 micro spot size, no spaces between the spots, so it should be a confluent application. You must do titration. So titration is a concept whereby you choose an area outside the macula at 5% duty cycle. On average, you go to 400 milliwatts of power, then you see a visible burn. And then on the subliminal machine, on the easy red, you just press the button, titration button, and then it automatically reduces the power by 50%, so you don't have to turn it down yourself. And then you proceed to treat the thickened areas for DME or the hot spots on, on the fluorescein in CSR. So titration is important. I know we have other groups uh, around that uh, recommend fixed uh, power. And again, our, our group doesn't agree with that because every patient is different, uh, particularly from where I come from in the Asia Pacific, it's a more pigmented RPE. So you don't need as high a power to achieve an effect. But the Caucasian patients were lightly pigmented, you might need to use slightly higher power. So you, every patient has to be adjusted for, and that concept is very important to share. How does it work? There's good evidence from the Japanese group that by RPE stimulation, uh, you produce heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins are important to immune, um, modulate the, the function of the RPE cells and also um, uh, reduce the pr production of neovascular cytokines and upregulate androgenic inhibitors such as PEDF without damaging the cells. So this is all a lot of basic science studies showing that there is an effective uh, mechanism when you, when you stimulate the RPE cells uh, to produce heat shock proteins. 
So it's a very complicated slide, but this is one of the posters from one of the groups showing how the biological responses following thermal stimulation of RPE cells works. So what happens then when you stimulate the RPE, you trigger a stress response within the retina. Then it causes an overexpression of the 35, between 35 to 55 different genes. And these genes represent diverse biological functions. We modulate the biological factors in the RPE cells to reduce the amount of uh, edema. And these are primarily anti-angiogenic and restorative to the, to the retina itself. And there's been show, good evidence showing that there's reduction of VEGF levels and restoration of Muller cell function with subthreshold laser, restoration of the oxidant antioxidant balance, and improvement of retinal perfusion. And uh, Stella uh, Vujusevic, who is also a very big uh, proponent and one of our board members of the Soul Society, also has shown that there's improved retinal perfusion in patients with DME after subthreshold laser. And this was published in Retina in 2018. So again, I've, I've shared the, 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 this is my treatment guidelines, which is published on the SOLS, um, on the EI, EI review paper that was published two years ago. So for DME, this is one of the cases for Alejandro. The reason why I share it, because it's so illustrative and very well demonstrated, whereby a patient at the first time of non-center involving diabetic macular edema, a, application of uh, the subthreshold laser according to the parameters we discussed, and after three months and six months, there's complete resolution of the DME and improvement of vision. And here's a foveal involving diabetic macular edema, one injection of anti-VEGF, and at one month later, supplemented with a combination of subthreshold laser, and this is what I often do for my center involving DME patients. A lot of them have many, many clinic appointments. They can't uh, come monthly or every two monthly for the anti-VEGF injection. So the way I reduce their visits to the clinic is I do one anti-VEGF to reduce the edema, supplement it with subthreshold laser, and then follow them up for three to six months or three to six months later. And a, a lot of them uh, re do not require any further injections. So this paper published by Lee Tae Wu uh, as a review article in 2020 uh, argues that macular laser photogallation is still relevant in the area of anti-VEGF therapies and also in, uh, in steroid injections. CSE is a huge topic. We don't have enough time to cover everything here. Uh, suffice to say, there's equally large uh, amounts of evidence to show that subthreshold laser was superior uh, to PDT laser uh, in the treatment of uh, CSE. So this is a review paper published by Sasha Fauser about uh, for different macular diseases, which includes a CSE as well. So again, uh, in terms of doing CSC, it's much easier to do a subthreshold laser on your patient. As you know, PDT laser requires infusion of visudine, waiting for 15 minutes, and then application, whether you choose half lumens or half dose, and then the patient has spent two days avoiding direct sunlight. And uh, of course, there's a cost issue as well. Uh, here's a case from Alejandro's group whereby they, they had a case of acute CSC, and they treated uh, fluorescein-guided uh, subthreshold laser, and after about three months, there is reduction of the subretinal fluid. Now, I'm sure all of us are aware there's a clinical shortage of uh, Visudine worldwide in Asia and in Europe as well. And this shortage of vertiporphin has had a huge effect on the care of our, our eye patients throughout the world. Uh, for my part of the world, we use it a lot for PCV patients. So we rely now a lot on monotherapy therapy anti-VEGF. But for CSC, we've had to switch to subthreshold laser. So um, I think we'd like you to, to join you, uh, invite you to join the Soul Society. And this is the QR code. You're welcome to scan the QR code. That takes you to the website with all the information there. With that, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Alejandro, who will share some very interesting videos of real-life uh, treatment of, of patients with, uh, with subthreshold laser. Pleasure to see you full room. Thank you, Ken. So I'm pretty much going to go over again over Ken's presentation, but from a more practical point of view. So you, you can to aim uh, to aim to answer real life questions about how to manage in these cases. Just a brief recap. We can call it subliminal, subthreshold. The thing is that this kind of laser technique we are working with here must 
first cause a response from the targeted tissues, in this case RPE, in the former productions of anti-inflammatory molecules, and must be invisible at any time, at any moment, the day after, one year after. You cannot see it at the, at the oxygen, at the autofluorescence, you can only see the results. If you see anything, anything else, you've gone too far. If one, that's not some threshold, that's something else. And of course, laser is a controlled delivery of damage, so it's a surgical procedure. So it's operator dependence, requires some experience, you get better at it, and uh, the availability of standardized guidelines make it safer, more reproducible, and quicker to learn. Ken has already stated the reason to be and the, and the, the, op, the op main objective of Soul Society, and of course, natural, the first thing we produced directed by Jay Ceblani was, were those uh, guidelines, which we are going to go over them regarding why we selected every one of the parameters from less to more controversial. Duty cycle, 5%, that's a no-brainer. I think it's the standard practically everywhere. Uh, very few people are still working at different duty cycles, and the same for the pulse durations. Note that a pulse duration of 200 milliseconds within a duty cycle of 5% five, five will mean an effective laser time, summarized laser time, of 10 milliseconds. Spot size between 100 and 200. Anything smaller than 100, I mean, you spend too much time with the treatment. Anything larger, uh, any spot you miss is a large blank spot in a technique in which it's very important to do a very dense pattern. Of course, the, the um, strength of a few cells is very little, so you need to recruit large areas of tissue in order to obtain a clinically significant response. You'll see that on, on the examples that we treat relatively large areas. Power. You could, of course, use uh, universal conservative parameters, but uh, we believe that titration has certain advantages. First, prevents variability between patients, especially likely pigmented patients. We need higher power in order to achieve a response. And in heavily pigmented patients, even conservative, uh, let's say normal power, could be, could be dangerous. And a more practical one, titration takes into account the progressive weakening that all laser cavities suffer a long time. Specifically about, about conditions, Ken has already passed this, but remember just DME, uh, we recommend it for center and non-center involving here due to its uh, Due to its very low or an existing danger of phobial damage, you can use the you can use treat center involving edema. We are we'll talk later about the convenience of treating the phobia itself or not. You can use it in combination with IV drugs. You need to treat generously all the edematous area. OCT guide is great for this, even a little bit further, and checking after six eight weeks. And if there is no worsening or deterioration, just wait a little bit more and reconsider retreatment. So we need a little bit more patience to observe results than what we are used to with intravitreal therapy. For central serous, we recommend it both for chronic and also acute, at least after one month. Why? Because it's easy to perform, it's, it's no problem for the patient, no secondary effects, so why not shorten the lifespan, the lifespan of this central serous? It, it's, Absolutely acceptable, the first light treatment. I mean, the literature available on it is huge. It can be very reasonably put at the same height, at the same level, that PDT. You need to treat again widely, very generously, over and around the leakage point, and check after six weeks. And in case of central serif, if after six, eight weeks you still don't have the response, you can retreat. About the safety points. Although transphobia treatment is, has been demonstrated to be safe in expert hands, it's not encouraged, especially for beginners. Uh, you may have an accident, uh, an undesirable accident, and it is not necessary. If you need, I don't know, let's say 500 spots to achieve a good coverage treatment, the three or four spots that you need to treat the phobia will hardly make any difference, so you can spare them. After treatment, especially after your, first case, after your first cases, check them carefully to make sure there is no visible changes. 
If you do, you need to lower your power. Usually, when you perform titration the first time, uh, it's quite difficult to determine well, what is a minimally busy the burn. We do not talk about how much, uh, how much uh, illumination and so to determine this, this highly subjective, subjective concept. So probably in your first, in your first treatment, just uh, lower your power a little bit more. The therapeutic window is wide, so you will have no problem. And there's an extra point. So from the mathematical combination of power, spot size, and so, you obtain a parameter that named fluence, which is the density of energy that is delivered for surface of tissue. If you have the isoret, you can see that it's depicted on the lower left corner, and I love it as an immediate pretreatment security measure. You've set your parameters, you're ready to start your treatment, just quick glance at the fluence to make sure you are within the safe parameters. For example, if somebody has been using your laser before, I don't know, to treat a, a, some peripheral pathology and has lowered your spot size, it may go unnoticed by you, for, it may go unnoticed for you, and you may start treating at a highly concentrated uh, energy. If you make a quick fluence check, this will not happen. Generally speaking, anything under 12 is perfectly safe, between 12 and 20, you are mostly safe. In most of cases, start being careful with what you do over 20. I mean, more, uh, more, most of people will not show any visible changes in treatments around 20, but in thin retinas due to long-standing disease, high, highly pigmented patients, you could find it. And over 30 or 35, everybody will show changes. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. <coughs> First, a static one. Let's suppose we want to treat this diabetic macular edema. First of all, we would determine the power through 100, 200 microns spots, perform the tit titration, the peripheral matter, one, two, three, the spots we need until we see a visible reaction. When we have it, it's very faint reaction, then we can tune down the power 50%. Right, then we check our, our pattern, quick fluence check, and start the treatment. Just covering the area generously, sparing the fovea, this is our recommendation, and this, this will be easily 500, 600 uh, spot uh, treatment. One disc area is 100 spots, if you work in 160. You can see that sparing the eye from this half a dozen spots to cover the fovea will hardly have any consequence relating, relating treatment effectiveness. Another case, this one with video rec re recorded using the Mozart device from Quantum. Here we are planning to treat all these areas surrounding this quite a typical central serous, right, sparing just the fovea. Here we go. We are going to use the new, this new feature, the advanced titration mode. These, those are increasingly powerful spots, and you may be able to see that the last, the last two left very faint spots. So we lower our power 50%, quick glance at fluence, set, set whatever pattern you like. I like the square and I start treating. For safety, I also like to start treating peripherally. You can see one spot after the other, very close together, with no separation. If you need to stop for whatever the reason, you just replace back your pattern in position and the treatment will resume at the place you stopped. From now I'm going to show you partly treatment, not the full of it. You get a good idea, just so you can get the idea that we surround the whole area, we treat it very, very densely, very meticulously. Just to make sure the key is to recruit enough cells. Don't worry about treating too much, that's not the problem, treating a too large area. It's treating too powerfully, it is, but no problem about treating, about giving a few hands of spots more. And when finished, I like to treat around the fob itself. Mm -hmm. 
is a slightly edited video. Real treatment takes a little longer, but with a bit of experience, always under five minutes. And that be it. Done. So, guidelines and consensus are key in many surgical procedures, also laser, to provide reproducibility and soundness to any technique. We believe salt guidelines to be especially valuable due to its many contributors, many investigative groups from around the world using different devices. And for anything that you want to learn, of course, a step-by-step -step, step -step technique is the safest approach both for beginner and also the expert. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. So we'll have uh, five minutes for questions on the retina aspect before Paolo talks about vitreous. So uh, and any questions from the floor, you're welcome to take the mic. Yeah, you can come to the mic in the middle yeah, so that people can hear what you have to say. Um, there's a question from online asking, has micropulse or nanopulse ever demonstrated to have an effect on the choroid? Uh, no, I don't think we've done uh, that thickening. I mean, they're asking about uh, reduction of pain. Yes, we, we have evidence in that. Yeah, you want to so about uh, effects on the choroid, yeah. yes, we, we, our group has published, in fact, a study demonstrating that on 40 of central serous, after receiving treatment with subthreshold laser, we detected a significant thinning of the choroid, uh, like the one you see after treatment with PVT. Great. Okay, yeah, the, the lady in front. Thank you for your lectures. I wanted to ask uh, whether you noticed any change uh, between those uh, who had the laser scars regarding the vision. Is there any change in vision between uh, groups of with the scarring the, with the regular laser and the, those with the subliminal? And for those you gave uh, intravitreals, do you give it in the same day, the subliminal laser and the uh, Avastin or any NTVGF? And uh, did you compare any patients uh, with the um, uh, regular laser to deduct the energy to 50% and compare it with a subliminal laser or no? So the answer to now question one and three are about the same. So when the diamond study and the trial we ran in Malaysia was fairly similar, we are looking at whether or not number one is subthreshold laser as good as the traditional retinal laser. And we showed yes, it was. It, it, there was no difference. In, there was a similar improvements in visual acuity and reduction of macular thickness. But as, I, as we said, the main advantage is the lack of the laser scar which as you know, if you do very close to the fovea over 10 years, 20 years, the laser scar will enlarge and then it will cause a scotoma to the patients. The second question was about the combination therapy. I normally inject and then wait a month because then you have the residual edema that you see in OCT that that would be the areas I would target with a subthreshold laser. Yeah, re regarding treatment of DME, some people proposes to treat also areas outside uh, thickening uh, as you showed for CSC. I'm wondering if there's, you have an experience of there is a role to treat outside thickened areas. Uh, well, I mean, the more you treat the better in case, the more you treat the better in the sense that you are recruiting more cells. And since it's, it's such a safe treatment, there's no danger of over treating it. So I usually, Treat, uh, end up treating non-thickened areas because they treat the thickened areas with very generous margins. There is no problem at doing it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll move on. I'd like to invite Paolo Stanga, who's the director of the Retina Clinic in London. And uh, he's going to share with us uh, two talks in one. Thank you, Paolo. Thanks very much, uh, Kenneth. Thank you very much, uh, Julian, from... Uh, uh, Quantel for inviting me to present, to share our experience here with you. So I'm going to share with you how we uh, assess uh, the effect of vitreous floaters on vision and uh, how we treat them. As you can see, we've moved to the jelly stuff in front of the retina. So these are my commercial associations. Uh, we know that uh, the vitreous liquefies. We know that the vitreous undergoes two uh, processes, synchysis and synergesis, the liquefaction, with uh, the formation of cisterns, the aggregation of collagen fibers, and the vitreous collapse, what we call PVD. We know that when there's a, a liquefaction of more than 60%, the vitreous separates from the retina, what we call posterior vitreous detachment. However, this is not a one-off event. 
it starts uh, usually from what our uh, uh, findings around the age of 50. Now, the diagnosis of PPD is not standardized. It is not yet objective. It is not uncommon that people attend accidents and emergency because of a sudden onset of floaters, and they are told they have a PVD. But, you know, you can't see a vice ring, which is the hallmark of a PVD, in all patients. Sometimes it is difficult to find them, especially in myops. The vice ring could be uh, uh, down in the periphery. So it is not very easy sometimes to diagnose PVD. You could also have vitroskysis, which is a separation of the vitreous in, in layers, of course. And floaters can be treated. It's important to remember that floaters can now be treated. We can do uh, vitrectomy procedures, we can do uh, YAG vitrolysis. However, it is important to know whether there's a PVD already or not. And it's also important to know whether there's a PVD in the other eye or not. Back in 2014, we published our work on uh, uh, looking at the cortical vitreous, imaging the cortical vitreous using swept sociality technology. This was, I believe, the first paper uh, uh, using uh, OCT to diagnose, uh, to look at the bursa premacularis and the space of margin in vivo. And we had, we had a, a cohort of patients uh, with an age extending between five and 100 years. It was Tolentino in 1976 who described PVD as complete or incomplete, and Itakura in 2013 uh, describe the appearance of uh, vitreous pockets and how uh, PVD occurred earlier in, myop in myopic uh, patients. These are some uh, patients of mine. This is the same patient. You can see the floaters. You can see the shadow cast directly over the phobia by these uh, uh, floaters. This scan corresponds to this, to this patient, and this is the 3D rendering. You can see that there is an incomplete PVD the vitreous is still attached at the optic nerve head, and you can see that this is the floater in, in, in the uh, cortical stroke mid vitreous area that's blocking the view. So, living with floaters can be challenging, they can be perceived as bothersome. We've coined the, 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 the terminology VFO, vitreous floaters and opacities, because we believe that that is more representative of what the patient sees and what we see. We have to remember that we cannot see all the floaters seen by patients, because floaters are not necessarily just the aggregation of collagen fibers. Floaters can also be produced by the shadows cast by the interface between uh, fluid and gel. It is important to understand that floaters cause stray light and degrade contrast sensitivity. Myopia is increasing. You've got the figures there. We live in a visual world. We live looking at backlit screens, backlit monitors. I was looking at my phone a couple of minutes ago. I'm looking at the monitor here. This is the best recipe to look at to see floaters. Now, floaters or VFO uh, are usually ignored by uh, by, by the medical profession. Most patients are asked to leave with the floaters. And it is also difficult to correlate the number, size, and degree of VFO with symptoms. So we've recently published our methodology, the new terminology as I've just mentioned of VFO, and what we believe is a, uh, an adequate standardized and kinetic uh, objective assessment of vitreous floaters. We published this in the OSLI journal, Ophthalmic Surgery and Lasers in Imaging in Retina. So why can kinetic? Well, floaters move. Floaters are not constantly interfering with the visual axis. So we have to take this into account. And these are some of the methodologies, this is part of the methodology that we use. We assess central visual function. We assess overall visual function. So there you have some, so we did uh, a study looking at patients that, in, w that we treated, that I treated with what we call limited vitrectomy. Why vitrectomy and not laser? Because we wanted to remove as many floaters as possible to try to uh, come with proof of concept. So this is before and this is after limited vitrectomy. You can see the difference in, uh, in, uh, the, in OSI, which is a diagnosis of forward light scatter 
we also look at a light distortion uh, analyzer to assess stray light. You can see the difference in, uh, in values. Here you can see, this is not yet commercially available, you can see infrared imaging correlated with simultaneous OCT. You can see the floaters. As you know, infrared imaging, we've been using infrared images for a over a couple of years, and you can see how you, it shows more floaters than the ones we can see, and if we add OCT to it, it's even better. We carried out the NIE, uh, NEI uh, v VFQ 25 item questionnaire as well to assess patient uh, satisfaction. And let me share with you some examples before and after limited uh, vitrectomy. You can see some of the opacities here. You can see how the opacities are gone. And this is why we call it limited vitrectomy, because we leave a skirt of vitreous in the periphery. I only remove the, uh, the core vitreous, and I don't, in, a, in, in, in the absence of PVD, I do not induce PVD. This is the actual uh, surgical technique. That's myself operating. And as you can see, I uh, remove the, I do not induce PVD if absent. I tend to use 27 gauge. I do not remove the posterior nor the anterior cortical vitreous. And I try to go slightly superior to the arcades in order to avoid a curtain effect. And here are our results, some of the results. We did not observe any complications as expected and uh, a p-value uh, that's statistically significant. Right, this is another way of imaging <coughs> floaters. This is a way we are looking into now. 3D rendering of vitreous floaters is not yet commercially available. So this is a new methodology to assess vitreous floaters. We know that vitreous floaters cause stray light. We know vitreous floaters uh, uh, affect, can significantly affect the quality of life. We call that VFO, vitreous floaters and opacity. And we have to remember that VFO uh, are a result not just of bundles of collagen fibers, but also of PVD, as well as the creasing in the posterior hyaluronic, as I'll show you later. So let's move on to uh, YAG vitrolysis. And uh, people have been using YAG laser for a long time to treat vitreous floaters. However, most of the reports, most of, of what you've seen on social media came from, or uh, still comes a little bit, from anterior segment surgeons and glaucoma surgeons. Now, I wouldn't want my vitreous to be treated by a cataract surgeon. I do cataract surgery myself, but I'm a retinal surgeon as well. So, but you don't want a cataract surgeon to treat your floaters. You don't want a glaucoma surgeon to treat your floaters. Why? Because you need to have a full retinal examination. Every single patient that I see undergoes indirect of ophthalmoscopy with 360 degrees scleral indentation. Slit lumbar microscopy is not enough to assess the retina because the retina ha finishes at the ora serrata and the only way to reach the ora serrata is with indirect ophthalmoscopy with indentation. So this is how the uh, Quantel laser works. Uh, this is uh, from Carl Brass. So he filmed the action of this mirror that flips down and the laser and the illumination follow the same path, and this makes a big, big difference. We published our first, well, we presented, I presented our first results, uh, well, it's now almost four years ago, at the Jules Gonan meeting. Here you can see the creases in the posterior hyaloid, and this was my first ever treatment of yafitrolysis. I chose a very large fibrotic uh, vice ring. Of course, not all patients come just with vice rings. We have to remember that the vice ring is part of the vitreous, and there are going to be many other floaters interconnected to the vice ring, and there's also going to be the posterior hyaloid. All of this, all of them, and not just the vice ring, will cause vitreous floaters. So uh, <clears throat> with the support from Alex, uh, I set up a study. So I'm the chief investigator, and I've invited my friend Jerry Sebak from California to be a secondary site as well, so, so he's also be, uh, treating patients there. Now, uh, we do all of the uh, methodology, we assess the patients using all the metho methodology that I've just uh, described. Uh, our standard, our primary objective 
is to compare the location density and acoustic scatter of floaters before and after, and then uh, secondary objectives, you've got them there. We are assessing, of course, patient satisfaction as well, but patient satisfaction is obviously subjective. So we are using the absolute system for uh, assessing, so for doing quantitative ultrasonography. This is something that was developed by Jerry Sebak. This is our methodology, the methodology we've uh, developed, and you can see this is one case I'm gonna show you, there, the, some of the results. Uh, uh, we are halfway through the study at the moment. Some of the patients have now completed their treatment sessions. Patients can have up to, up to five treatment sessions. Uh, most of them have, had, the ones that have completed treatment have had between two and three sessions. So this is one case that one patient that you can see the, the large visor here, first session, second session, third session, and this is the actual video. This is not edited. This is real time. It's a, it's a fakey patient. So this is being done in fakey patients, and I can discuss with you later why some patients benefit from vitrectomy, why some patients benefit from yak vitrolysis. But this is real time. You can see the large vice ring, this vice ring was enough to, was large enough to block off the whole of the fovea, and the patient now can go running again, jogging again, because of the alleviation of the symptom of floaters. This is another example, another patient. This patient had a PVD. There was, uh, there's, a, there's a complete PVD in this patient and a myriad of floaters, many, many, many floaters in this, uh, in this patient. And uh, what I've done in this patient was what I called a posterior hyaloidotomy. I've opened a hole in the posterior hyaloid, a very, very, very large hole, rather than just treating the floaters, because it was the posterior hyaloid that was causing the uh, VFO rather than clusters of collagen fibers. This is, again, a fake patient. Most of the patients I've treated in the study are faking. Obviously, it's easier pseudo-faking. So, in conclusion, it is the, the correlation between the patient's subjective symptoms, imaging techniques, and functional tests enabled us to exclude patients who we believe were not suitable or did not need treatment. We do not need to treat every patient with floaters, nor we need to remove every single floaters to achieve patient satisfaction. We believe that with, with our test, the SKVFO test, which we published in OSLI journal, we can objectively <coughs> demonstrate the severity of, we can record the severity of symptoms and show the patients there's the severity of symptoms and we can correlate the results with post-treatment uh, findings. So we believe that we can now offer uh, options, management options to patients, we can offer observation, not every patient needs treatment. We can offer surgery uh, in the form of limited or full vitrectomy, and we can offer YAC vitrolysis. We have to understand that laser is a sequence of treatments, a series of treatments, and it, it can be very, very successful. I would like to thank my team. I do not work alone. Uh, Dr. Andrea Saladino, my current uh, uh, fellow, we have a, re, uh, a fellowship program at our clinic. Uh, Dr. Uh, Francis, uh, Javier Valentin Bravo, who has just completed his fellowship and is now back in Spain. Uh, that's the whole of our team, and thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. So, it's a very big topic. Thank you, Paula, for summarizing it in 15 minutes. Uh, I'm sure everyone has questions. Um, perhaps if anyone has questions, come to the mic. We'll take one or two minutes. Um, my main question is, a large number of these floater patients have psychological anxieties about how your, your study did not really show how you're going to weed out these patients' psychological. No matter what you do to them, they're still going to be unhappy and they'll be going all over the place looking for treatments for their floaters. It's a very, very, very good question. Uh, <coughs> it, 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 you're absolutely right. A lot of these patients have anxiety. A lot of these patients are on uh, antidepressant medication. Now, it is, 
interesting to see that after treatment, some of these patients can significantly reduce the, the amount of medication. Uh, so the, 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 the treatment does seem to have a beneficial effect. We are working with a, a psychiatrist now, so we are looking into this from a research point of view. Uh, and in, uh, at Floretina, the meeting in Floretina, I'm chairing a 90-minute session on the management and treatment of vitreous floaters. I invited to speak the psychiatrist we work with. So whoever is gonna be at Floretina, I highly recommend that session. Thank you. Yes, sir. Very good question. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I was wondering uh, what is about, so far, the in, uh, preliminary results of your study. What do you uh, think, what percentage uh, of success do you reach? I, I can't give you at the moment, I'm not keen to give results when we haven't finished the study, but from the feedback I get from the patients, uh, they seem to be very happy. It seems to be working well. I think what, the way I, what I say to patients is, if you want to get rid of all your floaters, you need a vitrectomy surgery. Now, it's a surgery. It takes me 20 minutes, 25 minutes to remove the floaters to do a limited vitrectomy. Most of them do not need uh, uh, sutures, they do not need gas and so on. I do a very thorough examination beforehand. So if you want to get rid of all the floaters, have a limited vitrectomy. Uh, now, if you are over the age of 50, you will develop a cataract. It's important to understand that. Even with a limited vitrectomy, because we looked into it and we thought, well, with a limited vitrectomy, because we are leaving vitreous behind the lens, we are protecting it, well, they still develop a cataract. Perhaps at a later stage, perhaps at a later stage than if we do a full vitrectomy, but they still develop a cataract. I still believe a limited is better than a full for floaters, because I'm not inducing PVD, so there's less risk of intraoperative tears. I still believe that leaving vitreous behind protects you from glaucoma 10 years down the line and so on. But we have to re remember that in the consent form, we have to state the risk of glaucoma 10, 10 years down the line. It's different in, uh, in uh, retinal detachment surgery because you need a vitrectomy, there's no way around it. So nobody, most people do not even mention the risk of glaucoma 10 years down the line. Everybody accepts that if you have a vitrectomy, you're gonna develop a cataract. Vitrectomy in younger people, than, in people younger than 50, are likely to develop a cataract. But it's, it's all, that's all accepted. But, you, you, but there are patients that do not want to have surgery. There are patients that do not want to develop a cataract or, or have cataract surgery afterwards. We see a lot of patients that have had uh, refractive surgery. So yes, we can do a cataract, but then they lose the benefit of having had, for example, LASIK blended vision. So uh, there are patients, not every patient needs to get rid of all the floaters because most people in the world have floaters after a certain age, but not everybody needs treatment for floaters. So yakin vitrolysis is a very, very good option. So I always say to patients, look, you can start with yak vitrolysis. We do one, two, three, four, five sessions. And then if you are unhappy, then you can have vitrectomy surgery as well. But yeah, that's what I tell my patients yeah. too, yeah. Great, thank you very much. So uh, in the interest of time, we have to end the session. I thank everyone for joining us this morning. Um, and uh, thank you very much to